Okay, we'll move into our first briefing um, for inquiry into shared and integrated education. And our briefing is from the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People. Um, you have the, the clerk's cover note at page 242, and then the submission to the inquiry from, from Nikki. And this session will be <coughs> unsorted. And we have our two witnesses. We have Patricia Lusley Mooney, who is the current commissioner, and Dr. Alison Montgomery, the senior policy and research officer. to make your opening statement and members will follow up with some questions. Okay. Can I first of all uh, thank the committee for inviting us here today to give <coughs> evidence to its inquiry into shared education and integrated education and I welcome the committee's decision to initiate an inquiry into these two important aspects of education in Northern Ireland and to garner the views of the stakeholders. <coughs> As many of you will be aware the principal aim of my office is to ensure the safeguarding and promotion of the rights and best interests of children and young people. And as part of my remit, I have a mandate to keep under review the adequacy and effectiveness of law, practice and services relating to the rights and best interests of children and young people. And furthermore, my office bases all its work on the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, or the UNCRC as it's broadly known. And my presentation this morning will highlight the key findings emerging from a consultation which my office undertook with children and young people to explore their views and experiences of shared education. The inquiry's terms of reference address the nature and definition of shared education, key barriers and enablers for shared education, and what priorities and actions need to be taken <clears throat> to improving sharing. Children and young people discussed these issues during the consultation, and I will make reference to their responses throughout this presentation. As you know, the Department of Education uh, established a ministerial advisory group to explore and bring forward recommendations to the Minister to advance shared education in Northern Ireland. And in line with my remit, uh, which I have just described, I offer to assist the Minister by consulting children and young people about shared education with the intention of ensuring that their views were incorporated into the Ministerial Advisory Group's report. The focus of the consultation was on shared education, however pupils and teachers from integrated schools participated, therefore reference is also made to integrated education. Although the consultation was completed within a very short time frame, uh, my office was eager to ensure that as many children and young people as possible were able to participate. So there were two strands. Firstly, workshops were conducted with primary school pupils aged between 10, 8 and 10 and post-primary age pupils aged 14 to 17. And secondly, surveys were completed by children aged 10 to 11 years and young people aged 16. And the surveys were commissioned from ARC, a joint initiative between Queen's University Belfast and the University of Ulster, which devises the Kids and Young Life and Time surveys, two modules of questions relating to pupils' attitudes and experiences of shared education were included in each of the surveys. 38 workshops were conducted in 21 schools across <coughs> Northern Ireland, involving more than 750 primary, post-primary and special school pupils. A key objective was to ensure that pupils from as many school types as possible were able to participate, and care was taken to ensure that the sample of schools recruited was as representative as possible. The workshops explored pupils' awareness, understanding and experiences of shared education and their views about how it should be taken forward. And I'd like to give you an overview now of the findings emerging from that consultation. Less than 50% of post-primary pupils indicated that the term shared education was familiar to them. Where they did recognise it, this was usually due to their knowledge of or participation in shared classes at GCSE or A level. Very few primary pupils were aware of the concept, although after it was explained, some suggested it referred to activities such as joint projects or trips with other schools in which they or other pupils had been involved. The, this lack of awareness was not entirely unexpected, as the term may have 
not have been widely used in schools and a significant proportion of primary pupils indicated that they had not had any experience of shared activities. Post-primary pupils' experiences of shared education were in many cases linked to their participation in shared classes, although other shared activities were also identified, such as joint residentials, drama productions or sport events <coughs> with other schools. Pupils also talked about sharing sports facilities or transport, and the potential for pupils to participate in shared activities appeared to be influenced by a number of factors, including the subjects they studied, the class or year group they were in, and their involvement in extracurricular activities. Children and young people who had taken part in shared classes or activities expressed a range of op opinions with regard to their experience, both primary and post-primary pupils welcomed the opportunity to interact and make new friends with pupils from other schools. They also enjoyed the experience of different learning approaches and gaining insights into other schools. And one post-primary pupil summarised many pupils' responses by saying, I think it's a good way to mix with pupils from other schools and to make new friends with people who have a different background or religion to us. A clear benefit of shared classes for post-primary pupils was the expanded choice of subjects available at Key Stage 4 and A level, and one pupil commented that it gives people more subject options. It's a unique opportunity. Some pupils uh, reported having less positive experiences. These often occurred where they had limited or negative contact with pupils from other schools. They talked about feeling uncomfortable if they were in a minority or feeling out of place when they attended classes in another school. And as one post-primary pupil said, joint classes are a bit awkward. We all sit at one table, but we don't really mix with the pupil from the other school. Another pupil said, you feel like outcasts if you're going to a class and walking through the school and they look at you because you're in a different uniform. A number of logistical issues, including transport arrangements and timetabling variations between schools, also impacted on the pupils' experiences. During the consultation, children and young people were asked to think about the kind of approaches and activities which they believed would be uh, effective in the development of shared education. And a significant majority of respondents to the Kids Life and Times and Young Life and Times surveys agreed that shared projects, classes and facilities would be a good idea. Pupils in the workshops explored this question in more detail, calling for more collaborative learning approaches to be employed and for additional subjects and activities to be included. Pupils said group work and more mixing <clears throat> activities would make it more enjoyable. And subjects like technology, art, PE, science and music, you could do them with other people better. Pupils also highlighted the importance of introducing shared education at an early stage in a child's schooling, of undertaking preparation in advance of shared learning activities and providing opportunities for pupils to feed back on their experiences. As well as highlighting opportunities for shared education, pupils were asked if they thought there were any barriers which might dissuade young people from taking part. And in response, some students, mostly at post-primary schools, acknowledged that they would be concerned about sharing their education with pupils from particular schools. Their concerns related to academic ability, cross-community issues, standards of behaviour and the increased potential for bullying. And to illustrate these concerns, a grammar school pupil commented on a non-selective school and said, I don't want to sound stuck up, but they don't push you there. We get better grades. And a primary uh, pupil admitted, I don't like the fact that if another school joins with us, we will have bullies, and the bullies will spread when we, when we do shared education. So logistical issues, including travel arrangements, timetabling, and different <coughs> school rules were again cited by many post-primary pupils as well as principals and teachers as significant barriers. A majority of pupils thought it was important for pupils from different schools and backgrounds to have an opportunity to learn together. Indeed, in a number of the workshops, pupils contended that the aim of shared education should not be restricted to bringing pupils from the two dominant religious traditions together, but instead involve pupils from all types of schools. However, pupils acknowledged concerns about <coughs> shared education occurring between particular school types, and reservations were expressed by pupils at grammar schools. 
uh, have been mentioned. In response, some pupils attending non-selective schools felt that grammar school pupils would regard them as less able and therefore be reluctant to become learning partners. Pupils attending special schools were very keen to engage with their peers in other schools, although a few did admit to being a little nervous going somewhere new. In response, pupils from mainstream schools highlighted a number of issues which they felt needed to be considered in advance of any shared activities with pupils um, uh, at special schools, including the potential of for bullying accidents, logistical difficulties and the challenge for teachers to effectively teach all pupils together. A special school teacher also welcomed the educational opportunity for pupils through their school's membership of an area learning community. And although she noted there was also resistance on the part of some mainstream schools to engage with special schools. Irish medium school pupils reflected on the challenges they would encounter through collaborative learning with English medium schools, where there would be limited opportunities for them to speak Irish. Integrated school pupils expressed a willingness to engage with pupils from all schools, suggesting that their experience and the modus operandi in integrated schools could support other schools to effectively participate in shared education. Principals and teachers responsible our responses echoed some of the views expressed by pupils, particularly in terms of the opportunities to build relationships and the logistical issues associated with arranging shared education activities. Additional challenges included funding, promoting shared education through cross-community links, and for a minority of teachers, managing staff or parents' concerns. To conclude, I would like to briefly reflect on the findings. It was evidence that, evident that shared education in most primary schools was associated with enhanced curriculum provision and the opportunity for pupils in year 11 to 14 to participate in joint classes with other schools. In primary schools, pupils' experiences were generally through joint projects or trips with other schools. In some workshops, pupils indicated that participation in shared activities had only been available in a specific year groups. Given the commitment in the programme for government for all children to have the opportunity to participate in shared education by 2015, significant effort, efforts will be required to expand provision across all year groups in primary, post-primary and special schools if this is to be realised. Many pupils recognise the value of shared education through the potential benefits for their learning and opportunities to develop relationships with pupils at other schools. While many recounted positive experiences, a significant minority offered less positive feedback, and some described collaborative activities and joint classes as shared but separate, because pupils remained within their own school or friendship groups and interactions with pupils from the other schools had been limited. Other young people talked about feeling uncomfortable when attending classes in another school, particularly where they were in a minority. And in taking shared education forward, it will be important that the objectives are very clearly communicated to all involved and that pupils are encouraged and supported by all stakeholders to be equal and effective collaborators. The provision of quality learning experiences must be a priority for all pupils, and appropriate mechanisms such as school councils or buddy systems should be put in place so that where pupils have concerns, these can be dealt with sensitively and appropriately. The attitudes of some post-primary pupils, particularly those who have less experience of shared education, were strongly influenced by their perceptions of other schools and pupils. Perceived differences in ability, social background and religion influenced their desire to engage in shared learning initiatives, and in some cases pupils' views had been influenced by their parents or teachers. If shared education is to be regarded as a positive learning opportunity, there is a need to confront and challenge such preconceptions. Evidently, one of the most effective ways to do this is to involve pupils in positive uh, shared learning initiatives. However, it will also be important to consider other ways to address pupils' concerns prior to their participation. As one principal commented, it is important to make people comfortable and get them in a position to embrace challenges. The consultation highlighted a range of issues relating to specific school types, which should be considered by the Department of Education. Pupils and principals in Irish medium schools were keen that the department consider how their schools could be included in shared education as it is taken forward. It will also be important to consider how mainstream schools can collaborate most effectively with special schools and be supported to address any attitudinal or practical issues arising. And, as already highlighted, 
Pupils and teachers in grammar schools expressed reservations about the benefits of collaborative learning with pupils attending non-selective schools. The perspectives of pupils and staff in integrated schools were quite distinctive. While many welcome opportunities to engage in a collaborative learning with other <coughs> schools, they pointed out that they were already part of an effective shared learning environment. And one principle reflected, shared education is fine as a starting point, but it needs more work. The consultation with pupils referenced the definition of shared education outlined in the terms of reference for the Ministerial Advisory Group, and which is now displayed on the Department of Education's website. This definition references the need for shared education to provide for learners from all of the se Section 75 categories and socioeconomic status, and to promote a quality of opportunity, good relations, equality of identity, respect for diversity and community cohesion. Findings from the consultation indicated that some shared education activities fulfilled these requirements more successfully than others. And in some cases, the main objective appeared to be supporting the provision of the entitlement framework in the post-14 curriculum <clears throat> and pupils' access to a wide range of courses. In others, collaboration was occurring between schools of a similar management type or ethos. And if pupils are to experience shared education as defined by the department's clear aims and objectives need to be outlined at the beginning of any shared initiative to which all stakeholders can subscribe. Ongoing monitoring and evaluation of activities which also involves pupils should be undertaken to ensure all objectives are being met. And lastly, the 2002 and 2008 concluding observations for the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child recorded the Committee's concern that education in Northern Ireland remained largely segregated. And in 2002, it recommended that the Government take measures to establish more integrated schools. And in 2008, it called on government to take steps to address segregated education. In concluding, I would like to say that I welcome all the efforts to address separation in the education system in Northern Ireland and the introduction of measures which encourage greater collaboration and understanding and which promote equality and respect for diversity. If shared education is to be implemented as an envisaged by the Department. This will create both opportunities and challenges for schools. Therefore, it is vital that all those involved in the delivery of shared education are effectively supported in their efforts to provide positive and meaningful shared experiences, mm. which are educationally and socially valuable for all of the pupils. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that presentation, and, and I'm conscious that this may be um, the last time that you present in, in your in your current role. Um, and, I, and I don't wish this isn't a criticism. Whenever I actually ask you about this, because I am concerned about how we consult with young people, and um, I know that I mean you, you've you've carried out various consultations over over your terms in office, um, and I really just want to sort of to see whether or not there are. Um, there's a formalised way in which we can maybe start to look at how we consult. And I know that you have close links with this, with, with, with the universities. I'm just wondering whether or not you have any relationships with the education and library boards and the maybe more, more formal routes that, and structures that they have. Um, well, yes, we would have engaged with the education and library boards and previous chief executives that would have been on them, so we would have had conversations with them. Obviously, we have those conversations also with the Minister for Education, and one of the areas particularly for participation that we're very keen on is school councils and the opportunity for children to have their voice there. Um, and certainly, we would engage with the committee um, when you're looking at this inquiry that you ensure that you get the voice of children in there, and that might be one mechanism by where you could gain some of that information, and in particular, the views of young people. Um, but yes, we have engaged with many bo bodies across the board, um, and particularly in my <coughs> eight years of being in post as well. I mean, and I appreciate me in this when you, you have you've, you've, you've reached out um, and you've tried to get as, as broad a sample as possible, but at the same time you're still restricted to 21 schools, which is still quite a tiny um, number by comparison to what's in, in, this, in the school estate. So, you know, is there an opportunity to formalise um, a relationship moving into the with the education authority? Well, I think um, what, I, what to I'm to trying to do is to get is to get government generally to look at the issue of participation. And what, what we have done over the last four years is engage with government around participation policy statements of intent. 
um, and they've signed up to those and we've gone back a year later and said you've signed up to this and what have you done. Mm -hmm. We have now extended that out to the department's arm's length bodies. So we have sent the same to the education library boards. Um, I recently have met all but two of the new chief executives <coughs> of the uh, councils. We wrote out to 26 councils and 14 responded. So we think it's timely now because we have some councils like for instance, Lisburn signed up to the Statement of Intent, but Castlereagh didn't. So we need to ensure when they come together as a new Super Council that they sign up from day one. Um, so we're trying to engage that we give some of that responsibility on to the duty bearers um, to ensure that they have a mechanism to engage with children and young people. So the Education Library Boards, the Health Trust, all. So there's about 29, um, apart from 11 out of the 12 government departments, have signed up to uh, the participation <coughs> of intent. So that's kind of the ongoing work that we're trying to do to get government and its arm's length bodies to actually think about the engagement of the participation of children and young people. Yeah, and I, I think just add just one wee point, sorry to interrupt. Oh. Um, just wanted to add one wee point that we have discussed um, the questions that we used and the engagement that we had with children and young people through <coughs> the surveys and the workshops with the Department of Education and they're now going to take the questions that we had used in the Kids and the Young Life and Time survey forward and to administer those every two years with um, pupils across schools to gauge um, to get some sense of their of their engagement with shared education and and their experiences of it and yes it was I would agree chair it was a small sample and um, it was really the time constraints that we had in order to contribute to the ministerial advisory groups work but the 21 schools were literally representative of every type of school in Northern Ireland taking into account sectors ethos um, ge geographical location and so on so um, we, it was a small number of schools but it was um, you know, a good number of pupils in a sense and as I'm well. Not, and I'm not being yeah. critical no. of the yeah. fact no. that it is. No, but we we were understand. aware it was a modest sample, really. Yeah, because yes. I understand that it, that it is a challenge in time constraints and so on, but I'm just wondering whether or not there is some other way that... There has to be a better have. mechanism, I agree with you, and that's where we've been doing some work around participation to try to encourage organisations and obviously arm's length body and government to look at the issue of participation to mainstream it, mm -hmm. so that when the Department of Education or Education Library Boards are looking at their policy alleged legislation that they actually include the voice of children and young people <coughs> and in the last couple of weeks before I go out of office I've been going around schools and um, events and venues where young people have been at over the eight years and again I'm still hearing the same message our voice has not been listened to and particularly around the issue of shared education I spoke to young people in Enniskillen who talked about the shared campus and they're saying all we hear is the talk of the adults nobody's asked us what we think so Okay. I mean, you'll, you'll be aware that the, the current um, education bill is likely to include um, the provision of requiring the authority to encourage, facilitate and promote shared education uh, and, and taking that as it is uh, and moving forward. How do you think that that can be assessed um, with regards to participation amongst schools? Well, I think that all needs to be written into the detail of the guidelines that come out of any piece of legislation around shared education, that children and young people must be included. Again, I can only go back to the work that we're doing, say, for instance, at the minute with the Department of Environment around their guidelines and community planning and ensuring that children and young people's voice are included in that and they're specifically mentioned. So if you're looking at the legislation that will flow from this piece of work, shared education, we need to ensure that children and young people are mentioned in that and embedded and that their voice has to be heard throughout the process and in the evaluation and monitoring of that. Okay, and would you say that would be your key recommendation? Very much so, yes. Participation of young people. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mr Lunn? Oh, thanks, thanks, Chair. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, the, 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 seeing that we've got mixed messages, I mean, there's one thing about asking children for an opinion or questions. They, they just give you it straight, you know. They, they haven't acquired our diplomatic skills, so they just tell you what's in their, in their minds, and I think that's brilliant. So when I, when, when I see that, um, you know, for instance, a, a grammar school pupil has said that, um, you know, I don't want to be stuck up but um, effectively we feel that collaborating with these secondary schools is perhaps holding us back. I, I, I wouldn't like to think that was a representative view, and this worries me about the size of the sample. I mean, uh, can I take it that, that, that that's an individual comment and not, not a general theme of the responses you got from grammar schools? 
Maybe I can take that yeah. one. Um, we were in four grammar schools, mm. and um, in three of those grammar schools, there was quite uh, an extensive shared education um, set of opportunities, mm -hmm. mostly through uh, GCSE and A level courses. Um, three of in three of the schools, um, all of the young people talked about some of the concerns they had about engaging with non-selective schools. Only one of the grammar schools was unanimously, uh, unanimously positive about the engagement with mm -hmm. non-selective schools. The other schools had some reservations around that. Now, the thing about the sample to say is that um, we were trying to, to collect a diversity of opinion from young people, so yeah. we really wanted to get the range of views. In some cases, um, the young people hadn't actually participated in shared uh, learning opportunities, and in some cases those were also the grammar schools speaking. Um, so there is work to be done to try and reassure pupils that their <coughs> learning will not necessarily be um, threatened in any way or that it's going to be um, mm -hmm. disadvantageous to them to engage in, in learning with other schools. But there is a strong perception out there in some of the grammar schools, which was also coming from the teachers and from the parents, where there was a concern that if their child or the pupil was uh, engaging um, in an, uh, taking part in a, or taking a, an A-level course in a, a non-selective school, that perhaps the, the, they wouldn't be um, experiencing the same level. And I think the important thing is that if, if someone has um, a, a misconception or um, a fear of something, it needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where shared education needs to go beyond the academic um, strand of this. It's about understanding and respecting and listening to the voice of young people and if they have a concern how that can be dealt with and how those concerns then can be met because again some of that may be around influence from teachers or parents but it could also be just something that they've heard somewhere and may not be reality um, and it, it's how the school deals with that and ensures that all of the pupils that get involved in any kind of shared education are valued. Hey. Right, because it, it, it seems to me that um, if, if, if you take sharing as being a process to try and improve educational outcomes, uh, that, that almost the best form of sharing is probably between a successful grammar school and a slightly less successful secondary school down the road. And it, it, it does worry me. I mean, what, what the children say is kind of instinctive. When, when, you, when you get it from teachers and parents of grammar schools and attitude like that, that they effectively don't don't want to be bothered, don't think it might hold their children back, and they can't see the virtue of of giving a helping hand in particular subjects or particular levels to uh, you know a school which which needs that help. That's uh, <clears throat> that's that's a wee bit um, disappointing. Um, but can I also say that's assuming that their perception is right? The children that come from the non-selective school could probably just be as capable and able when they merge and, and they do the subject together. Mm. Again, it's, some of this is around perception. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. The, other, the other perception, that, 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 that's my last one, Chair, um, mm. the reaction of children in integrated schools who seem to have made the point that uh, well, you know, we're perfectly happy to co collaborate with other schools, but I've made the point that they're already actually doing it uh, within their own school. Um, have you any comment about that, that reaction? I think it's about looking at all of the models of good practice out there and sharing it across the board. And if integrated schools already think they're doing some of that, then sharing with other schools will help enhance the other schools. Yes. And indeed, um, some of the primary pupils said, well, we might be able to show pupils in other schools how we get on in our yes, school. And exactly, yeah. so they were actually seeing themselves as educators, um, you, that, you know, that, in that, a that sense. That so moves you on to the well. societal aspect of it. That, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm... I'm sure an integrated school and another school in the locality could collaborate perfectly well. No reason why they shouldn't, but there may be a, a, an opportunity there for the other school to learn exactly that. That, that there's, there's there's no bogeyman here. This is a perfectly valid way to do your education. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Thanks, and apologies for having to leave in the, in the middle of it. And apologies if this question has already been asked. No, it was a very very useful insight you've given on, on the whole thing and from the school's point of view. Would it be helpful that we have really had a definition of what shared education is and have, say, a five-point five scale to measure the level of sharing? You know, from it, it seems it's such a range from, like, for example, with a school like St. Columbanus in Bangor in here last, last night uh, in the German debate, 
and integrated schools at one end of the spectrum, and then we have this, this, the two schools that maybe have the annual visit to the pantomime. Would it be helpful if we had, for schools and for everybody, we had like a five-point <coughs> scale of, of, to measure the level of sharing? I'm not sure if you necessarily need a five-point scale, but I think it would be helpful to provide um, a more detailed definition for a start about what shared education is actually about, um, and that you actually open up um, what the aims and objectives are, very clearly outline what they are, what are the outcomes that you're looking for, how do you measure the impact, um, and then maybe looking, for example, um, to the CRED policy, and just in the sense of how it's structured, um, it goes into a lot of detail um, about what the aims and objectives are, what the values are, what the principles are, but also what you're seeking to achieve at the end about meaningful interaction, about pupils full participation, about involving pupils in the planning and evaluation of, you know, of shared education. So certainly there's a lot of different shared experiences and it could be sharing resources and there's a question there about what benefit there is to, to children's learning and to their social development the sharing of resources where they perhaps never meet pupils from the school in which they're sharing the resources, right through to pupils going on a regular basis um, to <clears> another <throat> school or meeting somewhere in a neutral location and engaging in a very effective and a meaningful way. So there's definitely, you could say there's a continuum, I suppose, in a sense of, of what shared education actually is what it's actually achieving and what the impact is then on, on the pupils. So I'm not sure about a five point, but you could certainly seek to define different levels of sharing, yes. And then in terms of you talked about the barriers, did you you know it was very interesting to listen to the views of pupils and so on. Did you find the the, the, the geograph the, the geography of the whole thing, particularly in rural areas, a major a major barrier to sharing? Yeah, and, and some of those were down to maybe the cost of transport or the distance between schools or, or, or different kinds of issues. So I think it's not about one cap fits all either, but it's how you can be flexible within that kind of uh, number of schools to be able to be inclusive um, and for them to be able to say, here's the best way of, of us doing that. And sometimes part of that will be the funding that the school might need in order to be able to partake in some of those activities. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Mr Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I thank the Commissioner and uh, Ms Montgomery for, for coming along today. I'd just ask two questions. I think you've partially answered the, my first one in, in relation to Mr Lund's question. I mean, is the general perception that shared education is a threat or an opportunity? Uh, and Addressing some of Mr. Lund's remarks, he concentrated on, on the academic aspect of the grammar schools, but in a wider context, is it perceived as a threat or an opportunity? And maybe just to give you the two questions, in page 70 of your report under the area based planning, you made reference to many pupils and teachers were concerned about the potential implications of area based planning proposals. Maybe could you expand on, on that just a bit and, and what those concerns were and what they perhaps seen as? Presumably they saw that as a negative impact or maybe they saw it as a positive impact. Okay, I'll maybe respond to your, to your second question first. Um, yes, as part of the, the consultation, we, we did ask pupils about their views of, of area-based planning, what they knew about it, what they understood, and, and what they saw as, as opportunities and, and also possible, I suppose, threats. So, um, in a sense, younger pupils were concerned perhaps about getting together with pupils from other schools who they didn't know about their school becoming too, too big, about it affecting the teaching and learning provision within the school. Um, about bullying comes up, came up a lot amongst primary pupils, um, and there were concerns that maybe you'd be meeting pupils from other schools or having to be educated with pupils from other schools who were nasty or unkind or who didn't want to, want to play. So at that, that level, there were concerns about what that would mean in terms of you know different different groups of pupils, I suppose, within the school. Um, there was also concerns about having to travel if you had to go to another school, um, if your school amalgamated with another change of uniform, um, you know, and issues like that. Um, I suppose amongst principals and teachers were also um, consulted during the consultation as well, and <coughs> concerns that um, the the approach to area-based planning wasn't really taking into consideration. 
um, an open approach. It wasn't adopting an open <coughs> approach. It was really thinking about changing, making changes within the existing network. So it wasn't a, a blue sky type of thinking, um, but that the changes were occurring within <coughs> sectors, so that there was a, re a restructuring potentially within the maintained sector or within the control sector and so on. But pupils' concerns really were about what it would mean for them and their schools if they were to amalgamate with another school and in terms of how it would affect their friendship circles, their learning, um, bullying, that kind of issue that, I, that I've mentioned. So that was, that was really the, the key issues there. Do you want to take the other question? Which one is that? Um, yeah. About opportunities. I would say I, overall, sorry, I overall I would have said about 60 percent, 60 to 65 percent of pupils were very positive you know, about shared education, about the opportunities that it created, whether that was <coughs> academic opportunities or social opportunities. Um, but there was a significant minority who were also raising concerns. So even pupils who were saying, well, it was great to be able to meet pupils from other schools, it's expanded my friendship circle, they were saying, but I don't like having, I, the fact I'm in a minority in another school when I go there to, you know, to participate in classes, I find that a bit difficult. So it was difficult at times to quantify their responses because they often uh, said you know, something very positive and then reflected on it and said, but this aspect isn't so, so great. And that's why it was difficult to say, you know, it was clearly this percentage was wholly positive and this percentage was wholly negative. Most pupils were very positive. They saw the opportunities, but they also recognised the challenges in it, if that's a way And I think that's the important it. part. It's how you manage those challenges yeah. and, and what needs to be put in in order for particularly the concerns of young people to be addressed. Yeah. One primary pupil, I remember him saying, it's a good idea, but you have to be careful how you go about it. And that was how he summarised it. I thought that was very wise. We, all, we almost called the report that. The politician. Be, be you ever said that so far. <laughs> end up up here. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Ms McLaughlin. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you both. Uh, just going back to the, the issue of the definition, and I suppose... I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm listening carefully to what you're saying in relation to sort of almost levels of definition and tiers of definition of shared education. But if, if your organisation, um, Commissioner, had a magic wand in relation to the priority of definition, would it be about sharing resources or, you know, in terms of, you know, respect and tolerance and mutual understanding? Or sharing resources, where where would the priority be? I think there are a number of issues, and I think first of all, for me, and and after the the research was done, and Alison was obviously much more involved in that than I was because she was going out to speak to the children. I think the fact is that uh, young people see the benefit of this and the positive opportunity, but I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done around the understanding and respect and diversity that come from all different types of schools. And I think that has to be underpinning whatever legislation comes out of this, that we ensure that young people feel comfortable when they go there, that it's actually working for them and it's making a difference, and that they have a contribution to make, and they feel equal to all of the people who are involved in the shared education project. But it's, and I'm just being a bit chair of a devil's advocate in this one, but if it is ultimately about you know the work on understanding and I'm assuming mm. good relations and yes. tolerance, does that mean that educational outcomes are secondary to that? I don't think they're secondary. I think they can run alongside that. I mean, the issue here is that this is in an education environment, and obviously, education is important and the outcomes for that. But what you're asking here is for shared spaces and shared places, and we need to ensure that if young people are going to go in to be educated in those shared spaces and places, that there's a mutual understanding and respect of each other, and that they feel equal when they're going into, into those um, places to be educated. Okay. okay, so I suppose, given, I mean, what I picked up from your presentation was, yes, the variety in terms of definition of shared but more, more clarity in relation to integrated. Yes. Do you envisage then that, that integrated is the logical con conclusion of, 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 of a shared education process? No, I think edu integrated up. education has, uh, is part yeah. of the process and it's part of, of education in the widest sense and we would support that. But what we're saying is that whatever process comes out of this, it has to be embedded in equality and a strong ethos around education um, 
and you know very strong um, aims and objectives on how this needs to be delivered. And, and for me, as I said from the very beginning, the voice of young people in that on how they see it's working for them and where the barriers are. Okay, and f finally, Chair, if I may, in terms of shared education processes, and again because of the your very clear call for, for definition, but the variety of, of, of views on it. What evidence have we that shared education processes will provide or produce more socially and economically viable and even religiously diverse schools? But I think that's why you need to start the process to see how you can engage with the schools, with the teachers and with the children in order to get to a better place. And, and I am always worried that when you start something, we, be, we make it too rigid because there will be different flexibilities from urban to rural to, to other places that will, that will need that flexibility to be able to deliver that. But if you have the same goal or want to achieve the same outcome, then sometimes it will take some areas longer to get there than it will others. But I think it's important that at least the, the, the journey has begun. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Mr. McCausland. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was interested in your use to, of the, the word there about equality. And on page six of the report, there's a very good point made there. The pupils are encouraged and supported by all stakeholders to be equal. And effective collaborators. Um, that stated there as being something hugely important. And in that context, then, um, I was looking at, um, as your work is obviously based on the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, mentions made there specifically of um, Article 29. And if I could pick out um, D there, the preparation of the child for a responsible life in a free society in the spirit of understanding and so on. Um, sorry, wrong one. C it is. Um, yeah, the development of respect for the child's parents, his or her own cultural identity, language and values for the national values of the country in which the child is living, country from which he or she may originate, and for civilizations different from his or her own. So it's got built in there the concept of about social cohesion, but also cultural diversity. Yeah. In that context, if you're thinking about children coming together from different school backgrounds and them having to, if this is going to work with shared education, that they have to be able to come together on a basis of equal and effective collaborators. You don't want to get into that position. I remember Pierre Trudeau saying about Canada's relationship with America was like being in bed with an elephant. And you, you, know, you want a situation where children come together on that basis of equality if it's going to work. Um, and we want it to work. So, um, was there anything to suggest that? with schools in different sectors and even within a particular sector, having different approaches to cultural traditions, that children coming together may not be coming together on the basis of equal collaborators, because one may have a much um, different view from their school. Children will come with a cultural tradition from the home, but if the school doesn't affirm it, it's simply what's left at the home. But some schools do affirm much more than others. And there's an also paragraph uh, 31 2, where it says in that context that state parties shall respect and promote the right of the child to participate fully in cultural life and encourage the provision of appropriate and equal opportunities for cultural activity. There's no onus on different sectors to provide equally for cultural traditions. How do you see that? Did that arise as an issue? Maybe it's something that the children aren't aware of. Maybe it's something they're not going to express it in those terms. But is it something that they're conscious of, that there may be a fear of, well, they know more than, than I do, or they do more, or whatever? I, I let Alison come in, as I said, because she was more involved in the actual. But I think the important part is that there's an understanding, and maybe this is where sometimes there needs to be that single identity work done in a school first before you bring two schools together. So from that perspective and its understanding, but it's about when you bring uh, children or young people together that they have an understanding and a respect for the other's um, difference or diversity or culture or whatever it is, so that it's not, not going in with these kind of 
preconceptions um, of some of the issues that were raised in the in in, in the findings. So, and and the, uh, if a young person either feels that their voice isn't being heard, then that needs to be addressed, or that someone else um, finds it difficult or uncomfortable, then that needs to be addressed as well. So, um, in answer to your question, um, yes, the issue is touched upon more so in post-primary schools. Um, so it was around um, an awareness. First of all, was there an awareness on the part of some pupils that uh, they were actually engaging with pupils from another cultural tradition? And in some cases, they would say we got together with you know, the school down the road. But they were, didn't actually seem to be aware that the, the children were coming from a different cultural background or religious background to them. So there was some, in some cases, uh, there wasn't actually even an awareness that, uh, that, that the other children were different. The other issue in and around um, concerns, yes, some pupils did identify uh, potential for there to be difficulties in engaging with children from other cultural backgrounds. Sometimes this was in advance of having engaged in uh, shared education opportunities and saying, well, that might be an issue, it might be a difficulty. Um, but other pupils were very open and said, you know, something along the lines of, look, we, we need, we can't tiptoe around, was a, was a, a quote actually from one pupil, said, we can't tiptoe around this issue. Um, we need to engage with pupils from different backgrounds, including those from different cultural backgrounds, and we need to talk about the issues that are that have been difficult for so many years. I suppose you mentioned equality as well. Um, I think that comes up in terms of small numbers of pupils going to another school, um, you know, to take part in shared classes. And certainly, in a number of occasions, we were finding there was maybe only one or two pupils from one school going to another, and they find that quite difficult. You know, where they really were in a minority. But it would also would it not apply in the context of um, the experience, education, understanding of their cultural identity? I mean, if say you go to an Irish medium school, there is a cultural ethos there of Irishness, um, and that's taught and it permeates all that the school does because that's that's the purpose um, of, of the school. Another school may tread very lightly around cultural traditions. So uh, I, I just wonder there. Uh, well, there's probably an issue around support for teachers, exactly. you know, in advance of engaging then in some of this, this work. And we, we did say this very clearly in the report that um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of experience, expertise and knowledge has been built up through work done through the CRED. Um, policy and taking that forward, and we find a lot of teachers in schools, and particularly in primary schools, um, felt that they had developed, you know, a lot of understanding around this kind of work, both single ad single identity and and work with other schools. So there's a lot of expertise out there um, amongst teachers, and it's about sharing that. It's about finding ways of of utilising that, and and also within integrated schools where pupils and or teachers, sorry have experience, obviously, of dealing with controversial issues on a daily basis. And it's about, I think, harnessing some of that expertise, that knowledge, and sharing that as shared education goes forward. So there is, there is work to be done. And just very quickly, to two very brief points. On 31.2 there, have you, uh, as a commission, ever looked at that issue of the equality of cultural provision within different education sectors, as to whether that 31.2 is actually, in, in terms of reporting and monitoring the implementation of the Charter, has that ever been looked at? Suppose we look at it in educational context, yeah. you know, we would certainly take it into account that in the provision of education, whether that's looking at special educational needs, whether it's looking yeah, at Yeah, but it, that's very specific there. It says equal, equal opportunities for cultural activity. You know, we're not talking here about whether children have their, you know, access to yeah, it's well, it's like never, like it's never, it's on. never been something that has been raised with me as a commissioner that a child feels it's been denied its right to learn about its, its culture or, or um, in school in particular. So um, it, it, it's not an issue that would have been. The child raised. is not going to raise it maybe if they don't know that they have a right. Uh, that's it. Just yeah. in that context, um, how how would you know, how do you can you report on the thing or, or what is the current cycle with UNCRC? Reporting. It's supposed to be every five years. The last time we reported it was in 2008, and the um, uh, the committee is behind in um, in delivering some of that. So it looks like as if we the next report won't be until 2016. Although the UK 
government too, as the state party that has to report, has already um, progressed their report and has been handed in to the committee. And what consultation was there with um, in Northern Ireland in that regard? Well, you would have to. Uh, OFM, DFM are responsible for their input. You haven't, you're not aware of that, no. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm aware of it, but we didn't. We had conversations, but we didn't actually see their. Okay. their and the problem is, it goes into a UK report, so very often it's more English centric when it goes to the committee. And we've had this issue. The four commissioners across the UK put in their own report. Um, and we raised specific issues with regard to our own jurisdictions within that report. Now we haven't compiled ours yet because we haven't had a date of when we need to have that ready for. We're here and it's around 2016, so it should have been in 2013, obviously. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mrs. Overend. Thank you very much. Sorry, can I just say we can share those with you? We would That'll have be copies useful. of it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, thank you. Um, it's, we've had an interesting discussion about. Uh, the definition of shared education, and I will not need to go across that again. But just to, you, you mentioned at the beginning about prim some primary age pupils were not even aware of the term shared education, and I don't really think that's any bad thing as long as okay. they get on with it. No. And then I suppose as they get older, then they understand um, the academic benefits of of uh, shared education, and if they have the clear goals in, in what they're doing, then. Um, there are benefits in the, in the other aspects of, of their education and in, in, in their identity. And just to lead the conversation on then, um, schools should be supported, or you said that schools should be supported in, in pursuing shared education. Uh, do you think that should be via an external facilitator, or maybe you could tell us more about what your thoughts are and, and how the schools should be uh, supported in pursuing further shared education? I think the first thing was that, um, uh, just to go back to your first point that you made, was that this, this was a ministerial advisory group that was set up to look at shared education, and so it was shared education we were using as the term when we spoke to children. Mm -hmm. um, what we found was when we explained to them what the term shared education meant, then they seen themselves um, having taken part in that kind of shared education experience, which I think was important. I think what we're saying is that um, whatever comes out of, of this debate in shared education, that there obviously is, and even um, through some of the um, advice that we're given here today, is that there is a need for support for schools and for, for teachers as well. Now, that would be up to the department when it decides how this education or this shared education project should be rolled out, yeah. at what kind of support those parents um, or teachers should have. Uh, from that perspective of whether that is external or whether it is something the department itself will, through its own training units or whatever, do. Just so trying to, I'm just trying to ask you, what do you how do you feel it should be? You know, what is your opinion on how it would be the best way? A lot way? of expertise Tease. in the sector. Yeah. Um, I think there is definitely a lot of expertise in the sector and a lot of the schools we were, they already had developed you know, very effective links with other schools, whether that was through area learning communities, for example, um, or whether it was through taking forward um, education, mutual understanding, um, PDMU, citizenship, cred, and so on. So there's a lot of expertise out there already. The youth sector also has a lot of expertise and, and knowledge um, in terms of bringing you know, young people together and maybe uh, doing more um, less f uh, formal types of learning activities, which would be very helpful, I think, in preparing young people you know, before they go out to even engage in shared education um, initiatives with other schools. So I think we would say look to, the, look to teachers as they are there already, um, as they already have developed knowledge and understanding, initial teacher education as well, um, ongoing CPD, um, there could be opportunities there as well to support um, teachers in taking this forward. So I would say look to, to the experts as it were, as they are, as they are already carrying out their work um, and are already teaching. I'm just aware that you know certain types of schools might be more willing to yes. mm -hmm. pursue shared education while others wouldn't, and you would need. Maybe you would need an external uh, facilitator yes. to, to actually help those that are less willing yes. to, to pursue and, and give them further guidance or, or support in that, in that way. So certainly, uh, we wouldn't rule that out. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're ruling out um, you know the, the employment of, of external facilitators if that helps to give you know schools more confidence or something like that to to engage. But um, there is 
are feeling this. There's a lot I, I think I think the important like thing is that all schools buy into this and some schools will need more support than others. That's why I'm going back to that issue of flexibility. It's not about one cap fits all, and it's how that, that then they're supported and how they do that. And there is models of good practice already out there, and some schools may share that. Um, others may decide they want to go on another avenue and they may need support in other ways and I think that's important that there's that flexibility. Yeah, I mean it is such a, as has been said before, it's such a wide yes. definition and, and people are at different stages of shared education and, and every stage is, is good, you know, mm. um, so, but thanks very much. Thanks Chair. Thank you very much. Um, no one else has indicated, so can I thank you very much for your time you. this morning uh, and for your, your presentation and can I wish you well Patricia on whatever lies ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.